Hello. Sorry, Hey, no problem. <laughs> Folks at home got to see us somehow, right? <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. I know we're still coming in, but I, I guess I'm, who knows whether the computers will work or not. So I better start right on time while they're working. So thanks for putting up with uh, last week's computer malfunctions. I guess your law school's got things back up and running again. So I'm thankful for that. And uh, it's our first meeting since the beginning of Black History Month. So I thought I'd introduce you to uh, Good Father Gus, whose uh, technical name is the uh, Venerable Augustus Tolt, and uh, this picture looks old-fashioned because it certainly is. This is from uh, 1887, I believe. And don't don't uh, quote me on the exact minute of the exact hour of the exact day, but roughly 
1887, which is approximately about a year or two before Augustus Tolton passed. So as you can tell, uh, he, he passed to his heavenly reward at a, a rather young age. Uh, he was born into slavery, and uh, he and his parents either managed to escape or were set free. The, the history is not entirely clear on that. Most historians lean toward managed to escape. And they found themselves in Illinois. And Augustus Tolton had been baptized a Catholic, and he was very interested in the Catholic faith. He was able to get himself a great education, and he wanted to become a Catholic priest. As you might imagine, in that era of American history, that was a tall challenge. But good father Gus was up for the challenge. Although he wasn't able to get himself admitted to any U.S. seminary, he was able somehow, and this would be difficult for you and I in today's age, you can just imagine how difficult it was for Augustus Tolton, managed to get himself to Italy and to study in the Vatican and to become ordained a priest. Yeah, and at the end of his uh, ordination, uh, after his ordination and toward the end, he began to study various cultures of Africa, assuming that he would be assigned to an African country. And then he was given the assignment to come back to the United States. And you have to imagine a well-educated man like Augustus Tolton knew what that would mean to have to come back to the United States and be a Catholic priest here during that era of our history. And sure enough, uh, he, he experienced the kind of discrimination that you might imagine he would experience as he went back to Quincy, Illinois, which I guess was roughly where uh, his parents had been enslaved and he had been enslaved in his youth. He attempted to start a Catholic parish there. He, he encountered resistance not only from non-Catholics, but unfortunately from Catholics also. Eventually he was able to transfer back up to Illinois, and he was a huge success. He was a great servant of God. His parish grew and grew. His sermons were beautiful. His singing voice, from what I understand, was beautiful, although no recordings have survived, to my knowledge. Uh, he passed away. He literally wore himself out working so hard for God. He was coming back on a train from a, a wor working and traveling in the heat of Chicago, caused his death and he died a very young man as you can see there about a year or two from the picture the cause for his sainthood is being advanced not only by the archdiocese of chicago not only by the archdiocese in illinois where uh, his parents and he were enslaved but in other places too and it's coming along very well huh? there's no doubt in anyone's mind that he led a, a good life uh, he is by all means venerable and as his parishioners called him uh, good Father Gus back then. I guess we could call him that now. But uh, if you're familiar with Catholicism, and since I never shut up about it, you're becoming more and more familiar with it, I'm sure. Uh, we take quite literally the words of the Bible. We take quite literally the words of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ's words are more than just truthful. They are the truth. And when he said, those who believe in me shall have eternal life, we believe that. So we know that good father Gus is as alive today as he was then and as alive today as any of us are. So he can join us in our prayers as we open the class today. Likewise, we take as truth, because it is truth, the Lord's promise that those who do the work of his father in heaven, our father in heaven, our mother and brother and sister to me, said Jesus Christ. So what you're looking at here is a man who's alive and well, and more importantly, he's your brother, he's family. So. Let's invite them to join us in our prayer that opens our class today. And as always, I'm praying for you and about you. And if you'd like, I'll be praying with you. You're welcome to join me. I pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Forgive me for taking out my cell phone in the middle of a prayer, but I was on what I, I hope and I believe is a, is a good Catholic website here, churchpop.com. How could that be a bad website, right? And they had... Uh, this prayer, this prayer under their little article here about Venerable Augustus Tolton, about Good Father Gus. And the prayer goes like this. 
O oh God, we give you thanks for your servant and priest, Father Augustus Tolton, who labored among us in times of contradiction, times that were both beautiful and paradoxical. His ministry helped lay the foundation for a truly Catholic gathering and faith in our time. We stand in the shadow of his ministry. May his life continue to inspire us and imbue us with that confidence and hope that will forge a new evangelization for the church that we love. Father in heaven, Father Tolton's suffering service sheds light upon our sorrows. We see them through the prism of your son's passion and death. If it be your will, O God, glorify your servant, Father Tolton, by granting the favor I now request through his intercession, so that all may know the goodness of this priest whose memory looms large in the church that he loved. Complete what you have begun in us, that we might work for the fulfillment of your kingdom. Not to us the glory, but glory to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are our God, living and reigning forever and ever. Amen. Says Source, Source Archdiocese of Seattle. They did a good job at that. In the name of the Father, and Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So welcome back. And it's our fourth gathering together. And we're on our chapter four. So we're right on track with the syllabus. And hopefully we can stay that way. Uh, you notice we cover one chapter per class, except uh, in a few weeks where I somehow in two classes I have to cover three chapters. But we'll do it. Don't you worry. And <laughs> chapter four talks about Florida's Declaration of Rights, Article One of Florida's Constitution. And if you're following along in the uh, hardcover, chapter four begins right here on page. Imagine in the digital pages are numbered, but if you've got it on paper, we're on page 95. And we begin with that first part of Article 1 of Florida's Constitution. Now I'm going to do something crazy if the computer will keep up with me today. I'm going to do something you already told me you did not do when you studied the Federal Constitution. We're actually going to look at the text of Florida's Constitution. What? A common law class where you look at the text of the Constitution? Yes, it can happen, and it's going to happen right here today. So, you can go to my website, flaconstitution.com. It'll send you to a link, which will give you the current text to the Constitution of the state of Florida. And that's what we'll be referring to from time to time. If you look at our Constitution, it begins with Article 1, Declaration of Rights. Right there in the beginning is where we talk about rights such as religious freedom, freedom of speech and press, right to assemble, right to work, right to bear arms protection from searches and seizure, the grand writ of habeas corpus, all that comes front and center in Florida's Constitution. If you studied the United States Constitution, which I know you have, you see many of these rights, such as right to assemble, freedom of speech, religious freedom, are amendments, right? They're tacked on. The first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights of the federal Constitution, not so in Florida ever since our current Constitution, which was in its entirety enacted in 1968, we see human rights are front and center. They're right there at the beginning. And that was, as I talked about in the text, a place of primacy and was intentional by the drafters. The first right we talk about is one of political power. And we know that we have three branches of government, right? We have the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. And we have that under the federal constitution. And of course, we see the same under Florida's constitution. Now, could a state write a constitution where, for example, in the legislative branch, there might be a unicameral legislature instead of a bicameral legislature? Could there be a tricameral legislature? Could a state create such a thing? And yes, it could. No US state has done so, but that's certainly an option. Florida has not done so. Florida has a Florida House of Representatives and a Florida Senate, and this makes up the Florida legislative branch, just like under the federal government, we have a federal House of Representatives and a federal Senate. Likewise, we have a Supreme Court of the United States, and here in Florida, we have a Supreme Court of Florida, which when we study it in greater detail, you might be tempted to put the quotation marks around the word supreme at the Supreme Court of Florida. You'll see how its jurisdiction sometimes is not so supreme. We'll study that in greater detail. But could a state call its highest court something else other than the Supreme Court? Well, of course it could. Yeah, 
and many states have. In New York, the Supreme Court is not the highest court. The Court of Appeals is the highest court. That's true in the District of Columbia. That's true in Maryland. That's true in, in many places. So you do have the ability through your state constitution to provide a democracy that is slightly different in its structure than the federal constitution has structured our democratic republic. But you do have the requirement to have a democratic republic. That's a requirement that stems from the U.S. Constitution. So we talk about that first article there, political power. Getting back to our slides. And if this gets too awkward, then I'll stop going back and forth. But let's see if it works for now. Let me ask you this question to try to bait you in, try to wet your whistle, try to interest you in what we're talking about today. Let me pose this question. We know from our studies, for example, Michigan versus Long, says that a state's high court need not interpret the language in that state's constitution exactly the same way as language that appears in the federal constitution. And we know that's true. Even if the language is substantially similar, we know that's true. Even if the language in the state's constitution is verbatim identical word for word to that found in the federal constitution. So what does that mean? Does that mean that Florida's language in its Declaration of Rights is interpreted differently than identical language in the Federal Bill of Rights? As we talk about freedom of religion, freedom of the press, right to bear arms, should we expect different rules of law? God bless you. Should we expect different outcomes? And the answer there is no, not always. No, not always. As we examine each of these rights, many of which are named the same, many of which sound the same, what I want you to ask yourself is, has Florida taken a different path? Has Florida interpreted this language in the state constitution differently than the Supreme Court of the United States and federal courts have interpreted the federal counterpart? Think of it as you will, as a continuing analysis of that laboratory of democracy that I introduced you to as a concept in chapter one. In this laboratory of democracy, you remember that the federal constitution was what? Remember the jumping on the floor? The federal constitution was a floor, right? The full panoply of federal rights, whether they come from the text of the constitution or a ruling of the Supreme Court of the United States or a ruling of a federal appellate court or the code of federal regulations or the United States code or whatever that source of a federal right might be, that full panoply of federal rights is a floor is a minimum. It is the bare minimum that must be provided by each state. No state can sink below the floor. No matter how lofty that state law might be, it won't crash through the floor. But it is just that. It is a floor. The full panoply of federal constitutional rights is a bare minimum. States can aim higher. States can aim, aim higher. When we looked at like Florida versus Castle and other decisions where they described the state constitution as, as the ceiling, right? States can go higher. States can be a laboratory of democracy and expand upon the full panoply of federal constitutional rights, never denying even a single right found in federal law, but experimenting with granting even greater rights. So with that concept of a laboratory of democracy in mind, let's take a look at Article One's Declaration of Rights in Florida's Constitution and let ask ourselves, did Florida take a different path? I think that'd be a great way to compare and contrast what you already know from having studied federal constitutional law to what you need to know in studying Florida's Constitution. So let's keep that question in mind. With that in mind, that brings us to chapter four, Part A, political power, notes and questions to consider. Question one, two rights in Florida's Constitution, Article 1, Declaration of Rights, require those rights to be interpreted consistently with their counterpart in the U.S. Constitution. And we can see that if we look at the text of Florida's Constitution. The first instance I give you is Article 1, Section 12. 
that on screen. If we look at Article 1, Section 12, and I'll highlight part of it, it reminds us that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures and against the unreasonable interception of private communication by any means shall not be violated. No warrant shall be issued except upon probable cause supported by affidavit, particularly describing the place or places to be searched, the person or person's thing or things to be seized, the communication to be intercepted, and the nature of the evidence to be obtained. And look at the language from the text of Florida's Constitution that I've highlighted for you. This right shall be construed in conformity with the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution as interpreted by the United States Supreme Court. Articles of information obtained a violation of this right shall not be admissible if they would not be admissible under decisions of the United States Supreme Court construing the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now, looking at that language, what liberties are granted to Florida state courts to deviate and to interpret the freedom from search and seizure as found in the Florida's constitution differently than the freedom from search and seizure found in the U.S. constitution? You're shaking your head. There is no freedom granted there, right? Here, the laboratory has been closed up. It's been shut down. There could be no laboratory of democracy, at least when it comes to Article 1, Section 12 of Florida's constitution and its protection from unreasonable searches and seizures. Because within the text of Florida's constitution, we are constrained to interpret it exactly the way the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is interpreted and exactly in the way that not the Florida Supreme Court, but the United States Supreme Court interprets that language. So here in notes and questions to consider, we have our first example of a ship that has not sailed. We have our first example of an opportunity lost. We have our first example of an inability for the laboratory of democracy to function. We have our first example of a state court powerless to expand upon that bare minimum federal right with reference to the state's constitution, right? Because the text of the constitution ties the hands of the state and makes search and seizure law under Florida's constitution in lockstep, if you will, L-O-C-K-S-T-E-P, some of the scholars like to use that phrase, in lockstep with that of the federal constitution. And you see why, because the text of Florida's constitution requires it to be so. Reading onward in that first note and question to consider on page 96, the right of protection from excessive punishment states that it, quote, shall be construed in conformity with decisions of the United States Supreme Court, which interpret the prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment provided in the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Any method of execution shall be allowed unless prohibited by the United States Constitution. And now I'm quoting from Section 17. Come on, Section 17. There you are. <laughs> Section 17. Here we see in Florida's Constitution a reference within the text of Florida's Constitution to the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Do you see that in this language right there? It says here that it shall be construed in conformity with decisions of the United States Supreme Court. So yet again, looking at section 17, we see the same requirement of lockstep that we saw in section 12, correct? So can there be a laboratory of democracy when it comes to cruel and unusual punishment, when it comes to excessive punishments, when it comes to protecting Floridians from cruel, unusual, or excessive punishments? No, no, we've lost that ability. We've lost that part of the laboratory of democracy here in Florida when it comes to that particular right. Would you agree with me? Do you see a way to interpret Article 1, Section 17 differently than its interpretation of the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution? I don't. 
No court has so far. It would seem clear from the plain language of Florida's constitution that the intent was that there not be a deviation, correct? So that's the point of note and question consider number one. And the, that long note ends with this question, which I hope you know the answer by now. The question is, can Florida's courts interpret either of these rights differently than their federal counterpart? Who says that the answer is no? Raise your hand. That's the correct answer. The answer is no. Let's move on now to note two. What about the other rights appearing in Florida's constitution? What about the other rights in Article One, Declaration of Rights of Florida's constitution? Can they be interpreted differently? You remember the lesson of Michigan versus Long? Yes, what's the answer? Yes, yes they can be interpreted differently if what? What's the rule of law? We need an adequate and independent state law basis for doing so, right? Yes, that's the ruling, that's the takeaway, that's the rule of law from Michigan versus Long, which is not a Florida Supreme Court decision, it is a Supreme Court of the United States decision, right? It is a decision where SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States, spells out how to deny SCOTUS jurisdiction over a claim of a petition for certiorari from a state high court decision. We look at the face of the state high court's decision if SCOTUS agrees that the face of the state's high court decision has on it an adequate and independent state law basis, then SCOTUS lacks jurisdiction to review that decision. You have a question? Even if it uh, goes against the, the U.S. Constitution and the Florida Constitution, so long as it's adequate and independent? It's Your question begs the question. You're saying as long as it goes against the Constitution, they lack jurisdiction if it's adequate and independent. But it can't be adequate. It can't be adequate if it goes against the federal Constitution. Remember, the full panoply of federal rights are a minimum. They're a floor below which nothing can sink. That's the test of adequacy stated in the colloquially. Stated more technically, we cannot deny the full panoply of federal constitutional rights. Stated in the vernacular, we can't sink below the floor. Either way, what we're saying is you fail the test of adequacy if you violate federal rights. Well, we can technically inadequately interpret it. You can't inadequately interpret because judges are humans and humans make mistakes, and that's what appellate courts are for. So SCOTUS has jurisdiction over an error of law when that error results in a denial of part of the full panoply of federal rights, such as a state high court's decision that is unconstitutional under the federal constitution. That kind of decision would fail the legal standard of adequacy and SCOTUS in its discretion can grant a petition for writ of certiorari because SCOTUS has jurisdiction. Make sense? Yeah, I'm just glad our essay is <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but to sum it all up, you can't sink below the floor. There's no excuse for the state sinking below the floor. A state high court ruling or decision or law of a state legislature that denies part of the full panoply of federal rights is not adequate to be adequate. You must respect and grant and not violate any of the full panoply of federal constitutional rights, federal human rights. If you do, you fail the test of adequacy. If you fail the test of adequacy, federal courts can take jurisdiction, including the Supreme Court of the United States. The words are a mouthful, but the concept is simple. The concept is this. We've got a floor and we've got a ceiling. The floor is what? The floor is the U.S. Constitution, and where else can you find federal rights? How about U.S. Supreme Court precedent? There's allegedly, a, apparently, and evidently a federal right of privacy. Go ahead and, and do what I've done with the state constitution. Open up the federal constitution, okay, and do a word search. Maybe that's Control-F on 
on Windows. Maybe that's Apple F on Apple. But but don't trust your eyes. Use the computer. Find every instance of the word privacy in the federal constitution. After all, it's a federal constitutional right, right? Word must be in there. Pick a synonym for privacy. Control F, Apple F. Do a word search for that. Go ahead. Tell me all the instances. I got all day. I'd love to hear them all. Tell me all the, read to me all the phrases in the federal constitution to talk about privacy. Go ahead. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm not hearing any. Why am I not hearing any? Because there aren't any. Does that mean there's not a federal constitutional right to privacy? There is a federal constitutional right to privacy. But where did it come from? It comes from various sources, the most notable of which for our studies would be Supreme Court precedent. Right. It can also be found in the United States Code. Banking laws, for example, banks can be held liable if they don't honor your privacy. Doctors can be held liable if they share your medical records inappropriately. That's part of a health insurance portability act from the 1990s. It's part of HIPAA. There's a great many sources of federal constitutional rights, federal human rights, great many sources of that full panoply of federal constitutional rights. States don't have the right to deny any of those unless the federal government says, I created this right and I'm giving you the right to violate this right. Unless the federal government does that, then no state law can do that. No matter how lofty, no matter how weighty that state law might be, the highest expression of the state's law is its constitution right here. It's the heaviest. It's the fat man in the room. But no matter how hard the fat man jumps on the floor, he does not crash through the floor. Why is this? Because the full panoply of federal constitutional rights are a bare minimum. They can't be denied by a state. We have a supremacy clause in the federal constitution. It says that notwithstanding the law of any state, notwithstanding the state's constitution, that the federal constitution is supreme and that the law is made pursuant to the federal constitution or supreme. So you remember the score, you remember chapter one, you remember our first lecture, you remember our first hour that we got together. We kept comparing the highest and strongest source of state rights, the state's constitution, and we kept comparing it to lower and lower and lower and lower and lower sources of federal law. Do you remember what happened as we sunk lower and lower and lower and lower? Who kept winning? Federal kept winning. No matter how light, no matter how low, no matter how little weight, no matter how low a source of federal, it still beat the highest, the strongest, the most weighty source of state, generally speaking. Why is that? Because in this laboratory of democracy, we can't deny any of the full panoply of federal rights. And our notes and questions to consider ask some of the things like that. Let's look at Note three, note that section 27 of Florida's constitution reads this way. And this is not an outdated version of Florida's constitution. It's the current, pull it up for yourself. It's there today. Here's the language from section 27. It disgusts us to read it out loud. In as much as marriage is a legal union, we're talking about legal unions here. We're not talking about anyone's faith. We're not talking about anyone's religion. We're talking about someone's state. We're talking about the law of the state. In as much as marriage is the legal union of only one man and one woman as husband and wife, no other legal union, again, we're talking about the laws of the state, no other legal union that is treated as marriage or the substantial equivalent thereof shall be valid or recognized. Okay, so this is today the current valid, enacted, effective language of Florida's constitution. So what does that mean today? If two men get married in Georgia and they go on their honeymoon walking in the woods and they're holding hands and they don't know it, they've crossed the line between Georgia and Florida. They've crossed the state line. If you've ever done that yourself, no one's actually taken any masking tape and put it on the ground to tell you where that is. No one's taken any spray paint and marked it from one end to the other. It's there somewhere, but who knows where? And these two newlywed men are walking and suddenly both their wedding rings just disappear, right? And one husband asks the other, hey, where did those wedding rings go? And then they realize, oh, we crossed, we crossed the imaginary line, the, the line that separates Georgia from Florida. And you see Florida's constitution says we're not married. So the rings just disappeared into thin air. That's what happens, right? That's, is that how it works? Have I got this wrong somehow? 
Well, of course I have this wrong. That's not how it works. There's a federal constitutional right that says a state must issue a marriage license, including to same-sex couples. And there's a federal constitutional right, it's all outlined there in note three of the notes and questions to consider, that say that other states must honor and give full faith and credit to those same-sex marriage licenses issued by the states. So it doesn't matter, does it, what the state constitution says? Because this language, Article 1, Section 27, is what? It's unconstitutional. Is that doublespeak? Can the language of a constitution be unconstitutional? Yes, the language of a subnational constitution can be a violation of the national constitution under our federal republic. That's how our system works here in the USA. So you can put this language in there. You can leave it there. You can read it all you want, but you can't enforce it, right? Because it violates the federal constitution. It's trying to sink through the floor, but no matter how hard you try, you can't violate, you can't deny, you can't fail to provide anything less than the full panoply of federal constitutional rights. And as outlined in the case law precedent that you see there in note three, there's federal constitutional holdings that say what I said they said. You have a question? So why isn't there what's, what's the federal constitution basically for all the different states that have like section 27, where it became unconstitutional, why did they just get wiped off the constitution? Okay, that's a, that's a good practical question. Why didn't somebody go and erase this language? Well, first of all, there's a process and a procedure for amending a state constitution. We're going to study that later in the semester. What you're going to find is that the federal constitution allows each state constitution to declare how to amend that state constitution. For that reason, every state's constitution within the text of that constitution tells you how to amend it. Florida, you'll find when we study it will be no exception. Ultimately, after certain procedures are followed, any amendment goes before the voters. But in order to get that amendment before the voters, procedures must be followed. We will discuss those procedures in detail when that chapter comes. Know for now that no one's followed those procedures when it comes to this language. But is that unusual? Well, if we look further on our notes and questions to consider, we'll find that it's not. Jump ahead just one page. We're on the notes and questions to consider on page 96. Join me in the notes and questions to consider on page 97. Look at note two. Page 97, note and question, consider number two. It says, note that until 2018, section two of Florida's Declaration of Rights declared everyone to be equal before the law, quote, except, what? Everyone's equal in front of the, before the law, except? The next word in your constitution about equality is except? Yeah, until 2018, that's how Florida's constitution read. It read like this, quote, except, that the ownership, inheritance, disposition, and possession of real property by aliens ineligible for citizenship may be regulated or prohibited by law, end quote. That was the language in Florida's constitution until 2018, which wasn't all that long ago. To whom do they refer? What does this phrase mean, aliens ineligible for citizenship? You remember in chapter two and three, we talked about how to interpret the plain language of a state's constitution, particularly we studied the canons of construction of Florida's constitution. We learned that you use the ordinary definition as it was meant at the time it was enacted. And at the time it was enacted, this phrase, aliens ineligible for citizenship, was understood to mean Asian Americans. It was understood to mean our brothers and sisters who are Asian. What this was saying was, until 2018, that everyone in Florida is equal under the law except for Asians because Asians could be denied the right to inherit, own, dispose of, or possess real property. Ouch, what's that called? That's called many things. That's called racism, right? That's called discrimination, right? That's called unconstitutional, right? Even though this language was in Florida's constitution, does that mean Florida could do racist, discriminatory, unconstitutional things against Asians? No, no. 
because you can't sink below the floor. You can't deny any American, any Floridian, the full panoply of federal rights granted by the Constitution and the laws enacted pursuant to the federal Constitution. And we all know that equal protection applies to all of us, regardless of our race, sex, religion, color, and national ancestry. So even our brothers and sisters who are Asian, just like every other race, sex, religion, color, national ancestry and group, have the full panoply of federal constitutional rights. And regardless of what language you might want to put in your state constitution, you're not going to change that. You're not. So I hope that answers your question. Jumps ahead a little bit to do it, but I hope that answers your question. Why is the language still here? The quick answer is because nobody pulled it out. But even though nobody pulled it out, does that mean it's operative? So, not necessarily. Not yeah. Why, when we, it seems like once it's, it's, it's constitutional at the federal level, it seems like there's, we need to amend the whole thing. It's like, hey, this is unconstitutional. This yeah, you, you would think when a SCOTUS decision like that comes out, every state would hurry up and immediately convene and go through all the procedures and get it in front of their voters and change their state constitution. Well, but that doesn't always happen. Why would it happen? I understand there, there is a process, but it's, to me it seems like it would be, once it's found unconstitutional at the biggest level, mm -hmm. that the whole thing would be able to bypass some of the other stuff. Hey, it was unconstitutional, and we don't need to amend our We just need to get rid of it without because I know there's idiots out there that are going to say whatever this one and another one, they're going to be like, well, I still want it in there, even though it's unconstitutional. I still want it in there. And it's just it's because they're idiots out there that do something. Like that. <laughs> yeah. So I, it it just seems like it's it's an extra level of unnecessary bureaucracy to be able to amend something that's not unconstitutional. Well, I hear what you're saying, and there is no need because the text of a state constitution can itself be unconstitutional if it violates any part of that full panoply of federal constitutional rights, which clearly some of this language does. Going back again to the alien land law, which was that attempt to deny Asian Americans the right to own and sell and inherit and possess real property. This was part of a nationwide movement to try to pass laws like that. Passed in some states, passed in Florida. And you can see in my top of page 98 there, the long history of folks trying to do what you say and to take the language out of the Constitution because it's unconstitutional. But the voters voted to keep it in. Some of the legal scholars quoted think it was for innocent reasons. Maybe they just didn't understand what they were voting on. Others saw a nefarious reason. But for whatever reason, it wasn't until 2018 that it was finally removed from our Constitution. You have a question. Yeah, and you raise an interesting point of political science. And what you raise is perhaps a third reason why you might see unconstitutional language not removed. What you're saying is, is that, as I quoted at the top of chapter three, there are those that see the Supreme Court of the United States as just another political body. You saw the surveys I quoted there of ordinary citizens, surveys of non-lawyers. Were these non-lawyers wrong? Well, it was their honest assessment. They honestly believe that the Supreme Court of the United States, just like the U.S. Congress, has political motives and they have an agenda. Those surveyed, the majority of them felt that way. Those surveyed, the majority of our fellow Americans felt that the outcome of Supreme Court of the United States decisions are based upon who the individual justices are and what political party 
led to their nomination. Is that true? Is that not true? Well, for, we have to look at a justice by justice situation. We have to look at each individual justice to answer that question accurately. And we have to look at that over time because what might be true for a flawed individual at one period of time might not be true at a later period of time. Lord willing, we're all on a path to self-improvement, right? So even if we do have a flawed U.S. justice, maybe that justice will overcome that justice's flaws. But your point is well taken. For those who believe the United States Supreme Court is merely another political body, they might want to be ready for when that political body changes its mind or changes its composition or changes its members, and they might want to have language ready to go in the state constitution. You're right. That can be part of the motive for having unconstitutional language in a state constitution or for leaving unconstitutional language in there or for failing to delete unconstitutional language. Yeah, it's a good point of political science that you raise. So, and, and we can debate like any point of political science whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, right? So, so that brings us now to some more rights that we're looking at. I know some of these rights will cause more conversation than others, that's fine. But now we move to equal protection. That is part B of our text. And we've got to jump on that because we took a look at the notes and questions to consider already. But what we here have here is that all natural persons, female and male alike, are equal before the law. And then that except phrase has been deleted. Effective 2018, thankfully. And all have an inalienable rights, among which are the right to enjoy and defend life and liberty, to pursue happiness, to be rewarded for industry, and to acquire, possess, and protect property. No person shall be deprived of any right because of race, religion, national origin, or physical disability. So that language is not verbatim from what we see in the U.S. Constitution, but certainly it seems to have the same meaning, the same effect. Has Florida taken its own path? Has Florida, with respect and without denying the full panoply of federal constitutional rights, granted greater rights of equal protection? And we'll explore that a little bit further when we look at our due process chapter and when we look at our chapter about the state constitutional right of access to courts. We'll be able to ask ourselves, is this actually an advancement upon due process and equal protection under the law? With that potential advancement, with that potential exception, we find lockstep. We find that the state's constitution and its right of equal protection is interpreted the same as the federal right. Part C talks about some of my favorites, and if I'm not careful, I'll spend the entire two hours or maybe even the entire semester on the, on the freedom of religion part, because you know that one still exists. Thankfully, we'll spend a little bit of time on one that doesn't exist anymore, freedom of speech. May it rest in peace. I miss it. Tried to lecture on it from 2005 to the present. Invariably, you, the students, will contradict me, tell me that I'm wrong, tell me that it shouldn't be that way. And what I found is over time, you're going to win. You're right. Because a body politic, a group such as Americans, who don't want a certain right, if they don't want that right, they'll find a way to kill that right. My son's 11. He's in Cub Scouts, but he may soon be in Boy Scouts. He's in his second year of Weeblos, Weeblos 2, Arrow of Light Weeblos. They cross over and become Boy Scouts if they stick with it. And this weekend, got to go to Moss Park here in Orange County. We couldn't camp out like we wanted to because coronavirus, they don't offer camp outs anymore. But we're at least able to get together in the woods and uh, for a nature hike. It's not quite a camp out, but at least it's something, you know. It's a Cub Scout and a Boy Scout thing to do, to go hiking, to go into nature, to go camping. So brought my son out there, and uh, the Boy Scouts were going to be there too, not just my son and his Weeblos, his Cub Scouts. And part of that was for them to experience what the Boy Scouts are all about. What the Boy Scouts are all about is be more self-sufficient, be more adult, be more mature, be more in charge of your own way. Instead of like us Cub Scouts where the dads tell the Cub Scouts what to do, it's the Boy Scouts that just take their own path. They decide what merit badges they're pursuing. They decide 
what pace they're going to pursue them on. Eventually, if they want to become an Eagle Scout, they choose their own project that they try to pursue. A lot of freedom there. So were the kids anxious to be free? Was my 11-year-old son and the rest of the boys anxious to go camping without dad, to go hiking in this example without dad? I got to admit, I love to hike. I really wanted to go hiking with them. So he's just looking back at me with those eyes that kind of say, at least in my mind, those eyes kind of say, come on, dad, come with me. And then there were other boys who were out loud saying to their dads, come on, dad, come with me. Now, they, they weren't anxious for that freedom. They weren't embracing that freedom. And that seems to be freedom of speech. Oh, I've hit the slide button, haven't I? That seems to be freedom of speech. It seems to be a freedom Americans don't really want. You know? We often talk in slang. We say that we have a cancel culture. Somebody misspeaks, they're out. You know, They no longer work in their profession. They no longer are honored the contract. If they're, if they're in entertainment or what have you, you, you cancel their contract. They, they said something we don't agree with. You know? Because Americans don't want freedom of speech. And as I've tried to lecture year after year about how certain speech is protected, you all raise your hands in a good-naturedly way and try to tell me that I'm wrong. No, I'm right. The speech I'm talking about is protected. But in the end, you're going to be right. Because you're the ones that don't want it protected. Say I say something disgusting. I say something horrible. I say something offensive. Is that speech protected? Some of you would say no, because it's disgusting, it's horrible, it's offensive. But the correct answer is yes. Under the U.S. Constitution and under our state constitution here in Florida, disgusting, horrible, offensive speech is protected. Yes, it is protected. And if you think about it, it's the only kind of speech that needs protecting. Do we need to protect the beautiful words? Do we need to protect the complimentary words? Do we need to protect... The words that fall so gently upon our ears that they make us smile, are these the words that are in need of protection? No. It's the disgusting. It's the offensive. It's the dirty words. It's the derogatory words that are in need of protection. The concept is simple. The concept is, is that we're not delicate listeners. We're not snowflakes. We're not delicate creatures. You can say disgusting, derogatory things. The concept is that even though I heard those things, I can still rise above them. The concept is that you and I and all our fellow Americans are so intelligent and are so worthy of respect that they can hear things that are untrue at the same time that they hear things that are true and even though they heard both the truth and the untruth, they have enough intelligence, they have enough wisdom to be able to tell the difference. That's one of the underlying concepts behind freedom of speech. And it's one of the most rejected by modernity. Our tech overlords protect us from statements they find to not be true. I can't post something on Twitter or Facebook, that Twitter or Facebook has decided is not true because Twitter and Facebook, our tech overlords have decided we need protection from the untruth. Now that wasn't the concept of freedom of speech. Freedom of speech wasn't bury the truth, hide the derogatory, mask the negative, shun away the things we don't want to hear. Freedom of speech was Americans and in their rugged individualism can hear both the good and the bad and still be good. Americans in their wisdom can hear the positive and the negative and still be positive. Americans in their wisdom can understand that some people say things that they themselves should never say. That was the concept behind freedom of speech. And may that concept rest in peace. I wish it wasn't dead. I wish that concept were still what the people want. But clearly in 
this day and age of modernity? It isn't. I've confessed to you before that one of my guilty pleasures is Star Wars. Sci-fi is always cheesy, but good sci-fi, despite its cheesiness, sometimes gives us a good allegory and makes a good point. In one of the worst of the Star Wars movies, both in plot and in acting, we see the character who will soon be called Emperor Palpatine, essentially being elected to the position of emperor, where all the democratic planets of the galaxy, remember this is sci-fi, have voted that he should have supreme powers because there's an emergency. And then one of the main characters through bad acting and with the cheesy line says, this is how democracy dies, to applause. And it was a bad delivery and a cheesy line, but it doesn't change the fact that that's true. That's how freedom of speech died. Freedom of speech died to applause. Everyone was happy when our tech overlords protected us from what our tech overlords decided was not true. Everyone was happy when they knew that if speech was harmful to our ears and distasteful to our opinions, that it could be regulated. It's not how it was meant to be. And that's why I say, and may it rest in peace, because the freedom of speech that I've been trying to pass on through lectures has been roundly rejected. You've got a question. I'm a bit confused because the tech overlords, don't they have the freedom to determine what, are, what is displayed on the platforms? Uh, they certainly do. They Apparently they, they are speech? publishers or are not publishers no, but and can't be held accountable for the fact that if they don't like a particular point of view, they can silence it. So, and where are the laws to the contrary? Well, they don't exist because nobody wants them. The same law applies to them. So the First Amendment, they can use it or not use it in the way that they determine. And I hear what you're saying. But is that what society should embrace? Well, that's, I guess, either way. You know, either way, someone's speech is being uh, impeded on, whether it's the tech overlords or it's the little guy that wants to say whatever he wants on Twitter. Okay. So from your point of view, one with a monopoly power to silence a point of view is a good thing. Or do I misstate? I think ultimately, if you have a point of view that you want to make, you would have to make your own avenue of delivering that point of view to where you're not impede someone else's First Amendment right can't trump yours. Okay. Because uh, well, what, what do we think about that? Well, what do we think about that? Your hands up. I think some of the, I think some of the same uh, can be said about a private school such as this one where yeah. you can play openly and you can um, utilize our program. Now, yeah. I, I'm not saying and, I, and I'm thankful for that. Um, and I, I'm thankful for those of you to put up with that. I'm not saying it's, it's oblivious. No, I know. Personally, the learn what's not. Um, it's, it's the quality of being modern. You said modernity or something like that? Yeah. Where I have to push back is people think that it's synonymous with younger generation. And it's not our, it's not the younger generation. Because I believe that it's more of us that will say, say whatever you want and let the chips fall with it. And, and I hear what you're saying. And I hear what you're saying. And, and when you look at that eroding away that you're talking about, you know, we can't really, from a political standpoint, we can't really blame either side of the aisle, right? The, one side of the aisle doesn't want to see the American flag be burned. 
Does it offend me when I see the American flag being burned? Of course it does. But it's freedom of speech. You should be allowed to do that. And then I should be allowed to say what a disgusting human being you are for having done that. And the reality is that speech only, people only want to stop speech when it's not good to them. Yeah. So, so when you have a situation where you have people like, you know, like the ACLU, right, they would say, this person is angry. This person is not angry. This person is angry. What gives them the right to determine or um, what has, what, where are some of the other groups like the ACL, you did that, and uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah, yeah, they were in the news recently. Authority to say that you are a group just because you say that um, I have a different point of view or a different standard. Yeah. So that, that in another way is another, is kind of like an opposite form. Well, maybe it's a similar form to what you're saying. Of what the tech, what the tech people, I think that when you when you look at the tech people, it's very similar to their university. It's a private university, they're a private, they're a private company, and everybody in America has the right to go to their basement or wherever they or wherever all these smart people went and create a Facebook or something of their own, where you can say whatever you want to say. Hopefully, so they did that. I mean, the Go ahead, the tech, go ahead. The tech guys got involved with like the, the parlor and a few other things, and they shut them down. Google, because I, 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 okay, I that, like, Google took, took them off. So basically, they, 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 they should have something so that you can have to like, come on, like, go to be able to do that. But, yeah. but the thing is, for them doing this, this uh, by them patrolling their own thing, they're in violation of 230. The, uh, the 230 is supposed to be for them to be like a telephone company. Like not responsible for what happens on the platform. You're talking about a federal law, public yes, law right. 230. You're talking about whether or not they can be held responsible right. based on whether or not they're deemed to be a publisher. Right. So That's what you're talking about. Once they started editing out and detailing people's speech, that created me. That's, well, they're a private company. So now you're acting as a publisher as opposed to when they were open, open air, they now, they, who, they're the arbiter of what is, what is speech. And they're acting, they're acting to me as a state sponsor because the fact that they're able to, whether you like it or not, eliminate a public voice. A per, a per, the president of the United States was still the president and they trimmed them off of all public I mean, all How's that for power? Media. That's because power. You're now state sponsors. You are not, he is, until, until the, 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 he was, until Biden was sworn in, he was still the president. Yeah. And if you're able to cut him off, yeah. How does that not mean acting as a state sponsor? You are you are the state of the, when you've got when you close down the the public square, and there's no longer a public square. It, 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 we don't have anymore. We don't have we don't even really have newspapers on anymore that are not biased. It's more the, the social media is turned into the public square that we have. And if you are now in control of that, we're even policing it. You're acting as a state, in my opinion, you're acting as a state sponsor uh, and policing it, and you were in violation of uh, Section 230. Yeah, and I saw Sorry. at least two more hands. Was just, your hand up first, Mike? This is what I 100% agree with you on. Right? I said, you know, is that when it's Donald Trump saying it, that's not offensive. It's offensive to um, people that. Raise a good point there. Yeah, I missed a hand. I forget who's. No. You want to raise it later? We'll, we'll call on you later. Sorry to miss it. But I can see our, speaking of our tech overlords, <laughs> <laughs> our slides have crashed again. This break will be exactly 10 minutes. I, I know I spent, what, 35, 40, 45 minutes trying to get the tech back up and running again last week. I won't make that mistake again. So whether or not the slides are back, I'll see you in 10 minutes. I've got 646 on that clock. So I'll see you at 656 on that clock.
I like that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's all right. I'm just dragging it because I'm giving up on the slides. Okay. Yeah, I wish they'd come back, but I don't know. Well, I 
Outside. <laughs> Relatively it's speaking, not, it's not as cold. <laughs> <laughs> I may have given up with just uh, 10 minutes or less effort, but I think I learned my lesson from last week that once this slideshow decides it ain't working anymore, then it ain't working anymore. So I apologize. I, I can imagine that the only thing drier and less entertaining than listening to me speak with some slides would be listening to me speak without any slides, but, but that's where we are. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for putting up with the tech. So we're continuing now uh, chapter four. 
We're talking about Florida's Constitution. We're talking about Article One, which is the Declaration of Rights in Florida's Constitution. We tried doing a crazy thing and actually looking at the text of a constitution in a constitutional law class. But you see what happens when you try to do something like that. <laughs> so I, I don't have it on the big board anymore. But you invariably are sitting in front of a computer either because I could see everyone here brought their computer with them or you at home are watching on a computer. Either way, uh, you can open up that web page. I provide a link to it from my page, flaconstitution.com, or you can do a Google search and you can find the text of Florida's Constitution in a real long article. One is the first article, as you might imagine. Yes. Uh, just to add to the tech issues we're having, the website is also down. So oh, okay. uh, your school doesn't allow you to visit flaconstitution.com from its Wi-Fi. Did, did it? Because I tried, uh, I got here about 12, 15 minutes earlier, so I, I tried, and I couldn't get on today. Yeah, maybe whatever temporary permission you had to visit my website has been revoked. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So. All right, so we continue now, and we're in Part C, which I called Freedoms Akin to First Amendment Rights. And let's take a look at freedom of religion. Read along with me. You see Article 1, Section 3. So that's the first section. Uh, first section is the Article 1, third subsection there, Section 3, the religious freedom. Florida's Constitution says there shall be no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting or penalizing the free exercise thereof. Religious freedom shall not justify practices inconsistent with public morals, peace, or safety. No revenue of the state or any political subdivision or agency thereof shall ever be taken from the public treasury directly or indirectly in aid of any church, sect, or religious denomination, or in aid of any sectarian institution. So I note in the text there, if you analyze section three, which clearly has three sentences, not four, did I mistakenly type that it has four? But if you look at those three sentences there, the first sentence is most in lockstep with our federal constitutional rights. But check out sentences two and three. So clearly, we have some textual differences there between what we might expect to see in the Bill of Rights and the first 10 amendments to the federal constitution and what we see here in Article 1, Section 3 of Florida's constitution. So if we look at the first part, or the first sentence of Article 1, Section 3, that's akin to the Establishment Clause that we're all familiar with from having studied the federal constitution. And the Establishment Clause prohibits the federal Congress from establishing a national religion, likewise, the establishment clause that we see here in Florida's Constitution, Article 1, Section 3, would prohibit the state of Florida from having a state of Florida religion if they would to dare do such a thing. And I've got a quote there from uh, Williamson versus Brevard County that tells us that the Florida Establishment Clause and the Federal Establishment Clause have nearly identical wording and are interpreted in the same manner as the courts. So we have some lockstep there. Now, prior to 2019, there were some Florida cases interpreting Florida's Establishment Clause and held that it required a statute or ordinance to pass the three-part test from a U.S. Supreme Court decision called Lemon versus Curlsman. You remember this decision and you remember being referred to as the Lemon Test. What we've seen is, I think quite clearly, from more recent decisions from the Supreme Court of the United States is uh, a walking back, a uh, taking back, a retreat from this lemon test. Uh, I cite there, for example, American Legion versus American Humanist Association. And uh, what we have instead is a different standard under the federal. I think time will prove to be true. With that said then, will that cause a divergence? Will Florida continue under Florida's constitution to follow the lemon test even though under the federal constitution, it seems that the Supreme Court of the United States has moved on from the limit test. Time will tell, time will tell. One argument would be that if it was lockstep, that it wasn't independent, right? Remember that if it's adequate and independent, then it can go its own way, so long as it does not deny the full panoply of federal constitutional rights. But if it wasn't independent, if it was in lockstep and the federal has changed, then the argument would be this, therefore the state has changed, right? So time will tell and we'll get us a clear answer from that within state of Florida case law precedent. But as we stand here today at this very moment of this very day, I guess we could call that an unresolved issue. Time will tell. Looking at the free exercise clause, we know that part of the freedom of religion from the federal constitution involves 
a right to, God bless you, the free exercise of religion. And Florida's constitution, like the federal, contains a free exercise, right? And I've got a quote here from uh, Toka versus State from Florida's Second District Court of Appeal 2002, telling us that both the federal and the Florida constitutions guarantee an individual's right to freely exercise his religion. When considering assertions that these provisions exempt a person from regulatory mandates, when compliance would contravene his religious beliefs, courts avoid questioning the rationality of those beliefs. And again, that was a 2002 decision, one that was in lockstep with 2002 era SCOTUS decisions. Is that still an accurate description of SCOTUS decisions? And then is that still an accurate description of the state of Florida? Well, consider, for example, the 2018 decision in the Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission. That was a Supreme Court of the United States decision that involved a baker who felt that his view of Christianity was that he couldn't bake a cake. Uh, I mean, no disrespect to a fellow Christian, but I, I just as an individual, I don't understand that. But so it, he felt that as a baker, he his religion prevented him from baking cake. Okay. So the, what was the question to be answered there? And that question might not have been answered by SCOTUS and Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights because the Civil Rights Board in Colorado did a terrible thing, almost like just I just did a terrible thing. They, they criticized the fellow Christian. Uh, you know, they were outwardly hostile to this baker's beliefs, just as my statement, unfortunately, probably was hostile to that baker's beliefs. The role of government is not to be hostile to religious beliefs if the free exercise clause is to mean anything. It should mean that government should not take a hostile view toward a genuinely held religious belief. So apparently the refusal to bake a cake or the alleged religious inability to bake this cake was a sincerely held belief by this particular baker. And the Colorado Civil Rights Commission was openly hostile to it, and that was the basis for reversal by SCOTUS and Masterpiece Cake Shop. And that was an important ruling. We need to hear from our nation's highest court that governments can't be hostile toward any religious, sincerely held religious belief. So that was an important ruling, but it didn't quite answer the question that was posed. That was along the lines of, do I have a constitutional right to not bake the cake? And that's an important question to answer in light of the second sentence that we see in Article 1, Section 3 of Florida's Constitution. You remember that second sentence read, religious freedom shall not justify practices inconsistent with public morals, peace, or safety. So the unanswered question of masterpiece cake, is that question answered by the second sentence from Article 1, Section 3? Is Florida taking its own path? Is it saying that you can't use your religion to justify practices inconsistent with public morals, peace, or safety. That appears to be the plain language of the text. Can that plain language be different than the federal constitutional right? And we know the rule of law. We know the rule of law answer is that we can not be in lockstep. We can diverge from the federal interpretation so long as the state interpretation has an adequate and independent basis, that test of adequacy requires that we don't violate any of the full panoply of federal rights. Does the second sentence pass the test of adequacy? If we say that religious freedom shall not justify practices inconsistent with public morals, peace, or safety, does that pass the test of adequacy? And to attempt to answer this unanswered question, Maybe it's easiest to attempt to answer it with the last word there. What if you're arguing that your religious freedom means you should do something that's not safe? And maybe that's an easier question to answer based on very recent case law as we all stay here with our, uh, with our masks and as we fight off the pandemic, we all know that we need to wear masks. We all know that we need to be socially distant and we all know that any building and every building no longer can reach its full capacity. 
it's always been true that the fire marshal and the fire codes said you couldn't pack people shoulder to shoulder, arm to arm, wall to wall inside a building. There's always been a number on the wall, and I'm sure it's here. Yep, there it is. Maximum, maximum, maximum occupancy 137 combined 274. So even before the corona pandemic, we couldn't have more than 274 people at the lecture here. But of course, now we have to have even less, right? For social distancing purposes, you've got the stickers on your chair. Keep your distance. Don't sit here. You, with your right, look to your left. You see a sticker, right? So, so we have that answer. You might want to have a religious service and pack the house, but SCOTUS says that to protect us from the pandemic, we're allowed to go even lower than combined occupancy 274. We're allowed to lower occupancy because of the pandemic. So. If we take the last part, we have a closer to an answer. But as we take the first part, religious freedom shall not justify practices inconsistent with public morals, peace, or safety. Look at just the public morals part. Look at that first part. What you've got is language that says religious freedom shall not justify practices inconsistent with public morals. So I ask, what is the source of public morals? What is the source of public morals? One of the things I like to teach, since I'm your friendly neighborhood bar grievance defense attorney, one of the things I like to teach is professional responsibility. And certainly every lawyer has to follow the rules that regulate the bar. That's a source of regulation. But is that a source of morals? Is that why lawyers do the right thing? Simply because they want to do the bare minimum that the rules regulating the bar require? Or do we hire, hold ourselves to a higher moral standard? For many of us, our faith, our religion is our source of morals. So how could religious freedom be inconsistent with public morals if our religion is a source of our morals? So that's a far harder question to answer, is it not? Misinterpreted, this would be a way of imposing one person's religious views upon another. Would it not? There are minor differences among the religions. There are sometimes major differences among the religions. Is it government's role to sort all that out? No, it is not. So we can't misinterpret that second sentence in that way. And that's part of the free exercise clause. Part C, we talk about the no aid clause, that third sentence. And you heard the third sentence. No revenue of the state or any political subdivision or agency thereof shall ever be taken from the public treasury, directly or indirectly, in aid of any church, sect, or religious denomination, or in aid of any sectarian institution. And if you remember our first lecture, week one, hour one and hour one and a half, I, I talked about this. I even had a slide about it, sectarian. What were folks talking about when they said sectarian? What did the voters understand that word to mean? They understood it to mean Catholic, Catholic, my faith, the Catholic Church. The sectarian no aid clause here is also sometimes called a Blaine Amendment. This referred, as I talked about in that earlier lecture, to a potential presidential candidate who was trying to gather votes by being anti-Catholic. And he unsuccessfully tried to get passed through the federal Congress. Thankfully, it didn't. One of his Blaine Amendments. He did succeed in several states, getting it passed into either state law or, as you see here in Florida, in the state constitution. And it's a Blaine Amendment. It says that you can't use taxpayer dollars to fund Barry University. You can't use taxpayer dollars to benefit St. Margaret Mary Catholic Church, where my son Patrick and my daughter Madeline go to. You've heard me talk about this before. So could the text of the religious freedom article in Florida's constitution be anti-religious. And at least in this particular instance, very unfortunately, the answer is yes, that was its intent. So we do have potentially coming from the Supreme Court of the United States rulings on a Blaine Amendment from another state. And that might shed some light on the unconstitutionality, I hope unconstitutionality, of the Blaine Amendment here in Florida's constitution. I see a hand up, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, the text says, the author suggests 
Yeah. Is that a strong suggestion? <laughs> there are, in any good con law class, there are unresolved issues to discuss in any constitutional law class. And if you're not covering the topic well enough, if you're not at least touching upon the unanswered issues. But when I wrote the text, I tried to suggest what the answers might be, acknowledging that these are unanswered issues. So I didn't want to leave the reader with just the question. I wanted to offer a suggestion. So that's what I did there. There's some professors that, like, if you don't say what they want to say. Yeah. And, and, like, like, I've been in those classes, too. No, I've been in a, I've been in those classes, too. So, so I'd like to think that's not me. And I hope that's not me. And I pray it's not me. Um, so we're not penalized if we don't, have, we don't agree with you. You don't have to agree with me. Okay. No, I'm not here to indoctrinate. Heard that, right? I'm here to educate. <laughs> I'm here to educate. And there's many things that I might say that you might disagree with me. And kudos to you. Because you shouldn't be here to be indoctrinated. You should be here to be educated. Uh, when we're young, when we're children, Things have to be taught to us in black and white. And, and some things are black and white. One plus one equals two. Two plus two equals four. No matter how firmly we might believe that two plus two really should equal five, it doesn't, right? But, but as our education advances, we get into more complex areas. We get into less black and white. We get into more gray. We get less clarity and we get more unresolved issues. And certainly any good constitutional law class is not going to avoid the unresolved issues. One of the promises I made started this class is that this is the class where we address the big issues so and you know you've noticed by now i'm a man of many flaws i have an opinion on everything everything any opinion i have today might not be the same as i had two years ago and it might not be the same as i'll have two years from now and maybe that's true for you too but as we hear different opinions that differ from our own we might hear them and adopt them we might hear them and reject them we might hear them and just put them in the back of our head someday and think about it later. You know, in this marketplace of ideas, some ideas will stand the test of time and others will not. Likewise, you might hear me voice an opinion that you strongly disagree with. Well, if you are going to strongly disagree with it, you might want to know how to argue against it. One of the great ways of knowing how to argue against the point is to hear the strengths of that point. Indeed, you're going to practice law. Some of you might litigate or negotiate. Many Areas of law involve either litigation or negotiation. And one great way to prepare for either the litigation or the negotiation is to try to think of what the other side is going to argue. What are the strengths of their position? And how might I respond to those positions? But if you can't fathom what those positions are, then how can you have such preparation? So maybe every word out of my mouth is something you disagree with. That could be a benefit to you. Because now you know what the other side is arguing, and you can fathom how you might counter those points. So, yeah, maybe I'm not uh, impartial. Maybe I'm more of an advocate. But as I warned you when I started the class, I'm not a law professor. I'm a lawyer. And that's what a lawyer does. A lawyer doesn't deal in uh, uh, theoretical, abstract, academic arguments. A lawyer represents somebody who tries to advance that person's point. So, yeah, maybe I did the same thing when I wrote the textbook. Maybe I'm doing the same thing when I give the lecture. But I don't think that's any disadvantage to you. And, no, the test isn't about can I memorize and regurgitate what McGinley said. Not in any way. Hope that answers the question. All right. So that brought us to the case we talk about there. Malachi, Malachi, M-A-L-A-C-H-I. I'll go with Malachi. Sound good? Malachi versus Archdiocese of Miami. And what happened in this case? Why is it in our freedom of religion section? Well, what we had here was a, a case of first impression, according to the language of the First District Court of Appeals 26 opinion. The question was whether the free exercise clause of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution precludes judicial review of a Catholic priest's workers' compensation claim. What are we talking about there? Wonder. If Florida statutes, like many statutes, we have Chapter 440, which is the Florida Workers' Compensation Law. It says that a no-fault system exists and that if you are injured while in the course and scope of your employment, then you're entitled to certain medical and financial benefits from your employer. Father Malachi got hurt while working for his employer. 
the Archdiocese of Miami, the, the Catholic Church of Miami, and was seeking benefits under Chapter 440, the Florida Workers' Compensation Law. What was the outcome of this particular case? The ruling was this. We hold that a priest's workers' compensation claim is barred by the church autonomy doctrine of the First Amendment. The Florida Workers' Compensation Judge of Compensation Claims, therefore, was correct in dismissing Father Malachi's workers' compensation claim for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. You have a question? I, had, when I, was, reading this, I, had, I, was, I was confused as hell as to... Uh, it's workers' comp. Yes, it may be a pre. It may be work. If I fall down the, at work, I should be able to get help workers' comp. Not and if I, it's during my duties of my work, I should be able to get that. Not to go up. Oh, you belong to the church. Sorry, workers' comp. You, you are uh, under covered by God, and He. You are <laughs> never, sorry, you, you, you're hurt. You made a place that's, that's for poverty. Uh -huh. so <laughs> after you. You're the higher power. Uh, we can't compensate you. You can compensate in the next life. <laughs> now I hear what you're saying. No, no, I hear what you're saying. But but let me try to ask the same question in a harder way. Where do we draw the line? But to me, it's if it's in the process. It doesn't matter. But to me, it's like I'm looking at it. He may have been a, real, a, a priest, but he's still at work. What is workman's comp supposed to be to provide you for financial? It's like if you get hurt at work and you're not able to do your job, you should be fine. It's like it's a way to get you back and to hold you over until you get your job working. Yeah. Unless, so we regulate Florida's employers. We require them to provide workers' compensation insurance to buy a policy. Right. If you've got four or more employees, then you got to buy a policy. If you're in the construction industry, even if you have less than four, four employees, you got to buy a policy. But the when it comes to a church, when it comes to a religious organization, these rights that we find in the state and federal constitution say that we can't apply that law against them. It's still, I don't understand it. It's, a word, it's not religious. It's not religious, but where do we draw the line? Where do we say we're going to regulate religion? But it's not and where do we say we don't regulate religion? But I'm saying if, if, you, if it's the job itself, I mean, it's any, if it's a blanket, like, like when you said. You so you would draw the street. line differently. You would say if it's a work related injury, if it's an employment injury, then we regulate. A church. We reg we require them to buy a workers' comp. Yes. They do. Yeah. Okay. So that's where you would draw the line. I'm saying is it let me ask you, let me ask you where if that's where you would draw the line. What about a wrongful termination claim? What if a church fires someone? It's I, I'm still I'm going off of the and like we said, we, well, I understand. We, I'm trying to lead you down paths you don't want to go down. I, I respect well, that you're I mean, resisting. For, 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 it's still it, it's an employment contract. If you violated the contract, and they okay, they, so so it. should we apply all of employment law to churches such as the Catholic Church? Uh, I see, where you're see where I'm going? I see where you're going. Okay. Uh, if it's within your employment contract. And you follow the employment contract way it's written, then go under contract law. If it's not stipulated in your contract, then it's not covered by the government. Okay. Now, Father Malachi happened to be in this in this case, so I'll use him as a hypothetical example. I've never met him. I'm not a casting aspersions against him. What if uh, he had won the case? He didn't. And this part of employment law applied to churches. Then would all of employment law apply to churches? What if Father Malachi wanted to preach within the Catholic Church the beauty of Judaism? I'm not saying that Judaism isn't beautiful. Indeed, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a Jew. Judaism is beautiful. But typically in a Catholic Church, they're preaching about Catholicism, right? Not Judaism. What if he became a rabbi and decided to preach every Sunday Mass as, as a rabbi instead of as a priest? And then... What if, in this crazy hypothetical I'm making up, 
The church then said, well, you know, we're trying to have a Catholic service. I'm glad you found Judaism. We wish you success as a rabbi, but we have to have a priest at our Catholic services. And then Father Malachi sued as a breach of his employment contract. Do we now force the Catholic Church to put on Jewish services because they have an employment contract with their priest who became Jewish? So there's a original contract to be a priest? So you would answer the question based on the contract terms. You would apply contract law to the church. You would. You would. But that's not how SCOTUS is interpreting the federal free exercise clause. SCOTUS is saying that the church has the right, and at first they describe them as those who are in a ministerial position, so that its ministers and the employment of the ministers was not bound by such things, such as the workers' compensation law that we see in the Malachi case, such as employment law that we see in other cases. Because, in SCOTUS's logic, religion needed the ability to perform its tasks. Am I crazy hypothetical, where a hypothetical priest hypothetically became a rabbi, that church now had a need for a priest instead of a rabbi. And SCOTUS's current interpretation of the Establishment Clause, clause the, and Free Exercise Clause would allow the church to fire him and replace him with someone who wanted to put on a Catholic Mass. At what point do we draw the line? Because if we don't draw the line somewhere, then it's not our churches that decide what's said and done and provided at church. It's our government that decides what's said and done and provided at church. If we don't draw the line, then that's what happens. The reason a church looks a lot like an employer is because it's providing a lot of the functions of an employer to individuals who may be ministers, but look a lot like employees in the eyes of the law, right? But SCOTUS has decided that the free exercise clause and freedom of religion means that we don't apply labor laws to churches. Instead, we allow the churches to perform their function. Now, you might agree, you might disagree. You might draw the line in a different place. My warning is this, if you don't draw the line at all, then you have a state religion. You do, that's the end result. If you don't draw the line, if you just say, well, there is no exemption for religious, workers' compensation applies, breach of contract applies, labor laws apply, everything applies, then it's the secular non-religious government that decides how the religious function. That's if you don't draw the line anywhere. So then the question becomes, where do you draw the line? This case is drawing it in a particular place. You're arguing you would have drawn it somewhere else. And with us agreeing to disagree, mm -hmm. my message is, look what happens if you don't draw a line. Well, there's another hand up. I'll be right back to you. That's yes. No, no, it's, people like to hear a voice other than mine. <laughs> Right, right. And, and those decisions are still coming. Like Masterpiece Cake, it didn't answer the ultimate question. Can a baker, for religious purposes, not bake that cake? It only answered the question of, you can't be hostile toward a religious belief. So there are unanswered questions in this area of the law. They are developing and they are arising. But I'm pointing out to you what the issues are. And in so doing, I'm also pointing out what the legal standards are. These are difficult questions. Yeah, it's difficult to talk about drawing the line between church and state. Yeah. You're talking about money, which is secular. And then, um, but at the same token, money, which is secular, has a lot of trust on it. It does. Another hypocrisy. So when you talk about like cases like this one, 
like the Smith case, where they say, oh, you're free to smoke peyote if you want to. But then it's another, there's another group of people that say, well, we want to have multiple wives. And they say, you can't practice that way. Then it's, it's, it's hard to understand. It almost seems to me like it's like a lazy opinion. And the court is just like, you know what, we just want to, we just want to, like, we're not going to deal with the Catholic Church because it's too powerful as it is. That's, that's how it came off to me. Okay. And, and I hear what you're saying, but the language of the opinion wasn't that. The language of the opinion was, we have to let a church perform its function. And in order to do that, the free exercise clause and freedom of religion means that we can't apply some of these laws to a church. And whether or not you might draw the line in a different place, I hope you'll recognize that if you don't draw a line, then control over church governance is a government function, not a church function. If you don't draw the line somewhere, then you have a government religion because the government is running all religions. Make sense? We looked at the Florida Religious Freedom Restoration Act. In a way, it's an enabling statute. We talked about enabling statutes. We talked about how sometimes, particularly when we talk about human rights in a organic document such as the national constitution or subnational constitution, sometimes we speak in glittering generalities. For example, we might say something like, there shall be no law respecting the establishment of religion. But how do you enforce that? How do you go to court and do something about it? If from one point of view, the Florida Religious Freedom Restoration Act is that enabling statute. From another point of view, perhaps it is a source of religious rights for Floridians. To the extent that it might be, then we have to subject it to that adequate and independent state law test. We can't deny the full panoply of federal rights. So long as we provide and respect that full panoply, that floor, then we can experiment with providing even greater rights. Warner versus City of Boca Raton might illustrate how the Florida Freedom Restoration Act does exactly that. What were the facts? Very briefly, very briefly, there was akin to a zoning ordinance. It was a land use restriction. It applied to cemeteries. All the tombstones had to be horizontal. The tombstones could not be vertical. On its face, this seems to be content neutral. On its face, this seems to be neutral to a religion until we remember the death of our Lord and Savior. He wasn't reclined peacefully in a horizontal position. He was hung from a tree, crucified on a cross in a vertical position. Perhaps for this reason, it is not uncommon for a Christian tombstone to take the shape of a cross which typically is seen in the vertical. Arguably, you could say that you could create a horizontal square and then draw upon it the vertical cross and comply with this law. But the greater question was, what standard do we apply? And did this law fail that standard? To answer that question, I bring you first to this language. Based on the foregoing, the protection afforded to the free exercise of religion motivated activity under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is broader than that afforded by the decisions of the United States Supreme Court for two interrelated reasons. So the Warner decision is looking at the Florida Religious Freedom Restoration Act and noticing that it's providing greater rights than the floor, the full panoply of federal rights is respected, but the Florida Freedom Restoration Act is providing even more rights. What are those rights? The opinion tells us. First, the FRFRA, that's the abbreviation for Florida Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The FRFRA expands the free exercise right as construed by the Supreme Court because it reinstates holdings by applying the compelling interest test to neutral laws of general application. From one point of view, this land use requirement that tombstones be horizontal, not vertical, 
might be called a neutral law of general application. We're saying here that the FRFRA is going to apply a compelling state interest test to such laws. To the extent that that was no longer the holding of the Supreme Court of the United States, FRFRA was granting Floridians greater rights than found in the full panoply of federal rights. What's the second? Second, under the FRFRA, the definition of protected exercise of religion includes any act or refusal to act, whether or not compelled by or central to a system of religious belief. So under the full panoply of constitutional rights at the time that this decision was rendered, if it was a compelled by your religious belief, or it was central to your system of religious belief, then we applied the compelling state interest test. That was the federal floor. The FRFRA granted greater rights and said that we apply the compelling state interest test whether or not the particular belief was compelled by or central to a system of religious belief. Religions differ. But there are religions that have a core tenet, a central tenet, and that allow certain other practices but don't require them. I can't speak for every religion because I don't have personal experience in every religion. As you know, I'm a Catholic. I have experience there. I know our core beliefs. And I also know that from time to time, the Catholic Church will deem something worthy of belief. It does so because belief in that thing does not contradict Catholicism, but has been deemed worthy to believe. For example, I've got my bookmark here with the prayer to Our Lady of Lords. The church has deemed it worthy to believe that Mary, the mother of God, appeared in the flesh in the 1800s to some children in France in the town of Lourdes. No Catholic is required to believe that. And I've met many Catholics who do not. Then there's me and my wife. And my wife, due to coronavirus, has had rescheduled twice now her pilgrimage to Lord. She's looking forward to getting there. Her name is Bernadette. Indeed, St. Bernadette was one of the children. So that's not a central tenet of Catholicism. You can be a good Catholic and not pilgrim to Lourdes, not have a bookmark of Our Lady of Lords, not believe that the Mother of God appeared in the flesh to some children in France in the 1800s. But you can. Now, I bring that up as an example of what we're talking about here. The floor, the full panoply of federal rights said that part of my Catholicism was protected, but not Lords, because Lords wasn't required. Lords was optional. This Warner case says that the FRFRA, the Florida Religious Freedom Restoration Act, respected that floor but went one step further and said that whether or not I'm compelled to believe Lords, if I honestly do believe it, then that's part of what is protected. Did the example help you understand what we're talking about there? Because again, the the Catholicism isn't the important part. It's understanding the legal topic that's the important part. So you got the legal standard from there. Okay. So what we see here is more than an example of an enabling act insofar as it's an example of interpreting Florida's freedom of religion different than the federal. And you see how they did that. And that's the example that that case provides. In the next section, we talk about freedom of speech in the press. And I kind of jumped the gun on that one. We certainly have covered that already. In the next section, we talk about freedom of assembly and petition for grievances. And what we have is a very simple sentence in Article 1, Section 5 of Florida's Constitution, which reads... The people shall have the right peaceably to assemble, 
to instruct the representatives and to petition for redress of grievances. So far, Florida case law has been in lockstep, by which I mean the legal standard under Florida's constitution for this phrase has been nearly identical to the legal standard that you know from studying the federal constitution. In our next section, D, we talk about freedom from ex post facto laws and bills of attainder. And the first thing we need to know is what's an ex post facto law and what's a bill of attainder? An ex post facto law is making something illegal after it's been done and applying it to the prior act. So, for example, maybe it was legal to bet on horses. And then later we changed the law and outlawed horse betting. After we've changed the law and outlawed horse betting, do we go and round up the people from two years ago, three years ago, and four years ago who bet on horses and throw them in jail under the new statute? No, because that would be an ex post facto law. <clears throat> What's a bill of attainder? A bill of attainder is the legislature passing a law about you personally. Now, courts do that, right? But you have due process of law. You get to offer evidence. You get to argue the law, and you get a verdict rendered. What I'm talking about here is a legislature, such as the Florida House of Representatives and the Florida Senate get together and say, from this day forward, Patrick McGinley will stop lecturing to people. And it's a crime for Patrick McGinley to lecture after today. That would be a bill of attainder. So you can't do that. We talk about the contracts clause and protection from impairment of contracts. And that's part of Article 1, Section 10 of Florida's Constitution. It says no law impairing the obligation of contracts shall be passed. And for the most part, that is in lockstep. In Section F, we talk about protection from searches and seizures. Remember I had Article 1, Section 12 on the big board back when the big board used to work? Can we have a Florida right of protection from search and seizure greater than the federal right? No. Why was that? Remember when I had it on the big board, the language of the text of Florida's constitution said it must be interpreted consistently with the Eighth Amendment and the Supreme Court of the United States decisions interpreting the federal Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So it must be a lockstep. Nevertheless, I quote from Florida versus Castle. We only have about six minutes left in our class. But nevertheless, I have plenty of time to read to you the entire majority opinion from the Supreme Court of the United States decision of Florida versus Castle. I can read the whole thing. And I don't even have to speak too fast. I don't have to go talk like that. I can talk at a normal pace. Here it is, per curiam. The writ is dismissed as improvidently granted, it appearing that the judgment of the court below rested on independent and adequate state grounds, period. That's it. That was the entire SCOTUS opinion. Remember when you took Con Law 1 and you're carrying around a book this thick because every opinion was that thick? Wouldn't it be nice if they had just been a simple sentence like that? Why do I include such a thing in there? Well, first of all, you see that SCOTUS is acknowledging that it lacks jurisdiction. Why? Because the judgment of the lower tribunal had on its face an adequate and independent state law basis. So that's something I've been trying to drive home for four lectures now that helps you to physically see it. There it is. Take a look at it. So, and of course, we can't have a different interpretation of state law for searches and seizures because our state says they're not allowed. The next section we talk about is... Lost my page somehow. There it is. Basic rights of a criminal defendant. And a commentator notes that this list parallels rights guaranteed in the federal constitution and there is no major departure from the decisions that construe the federal constitution. So our state constitution repeats the basic rights of a criminal defendant that we find in that full panoply of federal rights. Again, lockstep. Section 8, freedom from imprisonment for debt. Note that the 
Supreme Court of Florida in a 2011 decision called Del Valle versus State found that imprisonment for an unpaid debt can be proper. Can be. In that case, it was by means of restitution for a crime. The failure to make restitution could result in a, either a longer period of imprisonment or imprisonment itself. But keep in mind, for those of you who might practice family law, for example, you see there sometimes motions for contempt because somebody didn't pay child support or somebody didn't pay this or somebody didn't pay that. And due to this constitutional freedom from imprisonment from debt, you're going to have to do more than just prove they were ordered to pay and they didn't pay. You're going to have to prove they had an ability to pay because those who have, lack an ability to pay might still get a financial judgment against them, but they won't get their freedom taken away from them. They won't get imprisoned because of this right of a freedom from imprisonment. Section I talks about a right to work, which may be a misnomer. Generally speaking, under Florida law, there is not a wrongful termination cause of action. You might be part of a contract and you might be able to sue breach of contract. You might have been discriminated against, your civil rights violated, and you may be able to have an action for that purpose. But we are in what's called a right to work state which means that as long as it's not for a discriminatory reason, you can be fired for any reason you want. The flip side being that as long as you haven't signed a binding contract promising to stay for a particular period of time, you can leave whenever you want without penalty. And if you did sign such a contract, you can still leave whenever you want, just got to face the penalty. So that's our right to work, which may be a misnomer depending on your point of view. Quite interesting to read if you want to do it is the right to bear arms, how ultimately it's in lockstep. But the opinion I provide you there points to a very interesting origin for gun control laws. And if that sparks your interest, I encourage you to read the opinion. It's one of the longer ones that I include in the book. I usually get them a lot shorter than that. But it's a rather intriguing source of origin. And with that, we have now gone through Article I, Declaration of Rights, of Florida's Constitution. The final result was this. For the most part, Florida did not avail itself of the ability to experiment and grant Floridians greater rights. For the most part, what you saw was a restatement and a lockstep application of existing federal rights. Now, when we get to our next chapter, we're going to take a closer look at due process of law. And we're going to ask whether there's a deviation there, whether Florida has granted greater rights. Spoiler alert. It has. Not much. Just a little bit. But at least it's something. And that little bit is most pronounced in a state constitutional right called access to courts. Florida's access to courts is unique and uniquely interpreted from any other state's access to courts. We'll cover that in our next lecture, which will be our fifth lecture, where we'll cover chapter five. Until that time, may God continue to bless us all. Thanks for putting up with me tonight. Sorry for no slides again. Maybe I should invest in my own projector or something. I don't know. But hopefully I kept you awake despite the audiovisual problems. And thanks, everybody. See you next week.